Hey, Dr. B here, and in this five-minute video, we're going to go over why it's so challenging to synthesize remdesivir on a large scale. A couple things about it. You've probably heard of it. It is the only FDA-approved drug worldwide for the treatment of the coronavirus, which has been a worldwide phenomenon. It's not a pill. It's an injectable. And its structure is shown right here, structure 4B. It's about a molecular weight of 300 or less, I would guess, which means it could be a pill, but it's not. And why that's the case probably has something to do with its metabolism. Maybe the liver perturbs it, something like that. In any event, it's also a prodrug, which is interesting, meaning that this whole part here is cleaved, rendering it uh, with the active part of the molecule here in your bloodstream. So what you take is not what you, is actually active. And after that phosphonate ester is cleaved, you end up with this thing, which looks a lot like adenosine, uh, but it's not. It's a little bit tweaked. And so when the virus uptakes adenosine, it ta uptakes some remdesivir instead. And suffice it to say that gums up the works, renders it inactive. And that concept has been proven uh, in large-scale trials, I don't think that's in doubt. So we do have a way to actually attack this thing, and it's known that it works. How well it works, I'll let other people talk about it. I want to focus on the synthesis. Here it is shown here, and it really doesn't start from the beginning, since uh, sub it begins with these two substances here and here, which you'd have to synthesize. But you could also just purchase them. So let's imagine you do, on a massive scale, you probably would need oh, I don't know, tens of tons, hundreds of tons, thousands of tons in order to treat, uh, to do this on a worldwide scale. I'll have more to say on that in a minute. But these steps are not easy. This first step, for example, uses N-butyl lithium, which is a very moisture and air sensitive uh, substance. It usually is purchased as a solution in tetrahydrofuran. You also need trimethylsilochloride, very reactive species. That combines these two things. You then add on, you deprotect it here. See all those benzyl groups? That means a benzene ring with a CH2 group on it. They all get removed. We then add on part E here, which is the whole phosphonate ester. Uh, and then you have to fix up the fact that you've got all sorts of chiral centers that have to be right. There's six chiral centers in this molecule. Means That means three-dimensionally specific regions. You usually just look for the wedges and the hatches there. So once you start it, with these three chiral centers already intact, and by the way, they have to be not only relatively correct, meaning up, down, down, but also absolutely right, meaning that you don't have the non-superimposable mirror image of this substance. So once you have that right, you then do this step called chiral HPLC, which cleans up and removes some of the stereoisomers, which any medicinal chemist can tell you is very challenging since they're so chemically and physically similar to the actual structures, but now you isolate the individual stereoisomer and you then get 4B, you have to remove 4C, and then you have the final, uh, final product there. The yields are lousy. If you take each yield and multiply them by each other, so you're going to get 60% of the 25% yield that you had after two steps, and then 58% of that after three steps. So I think you could see if you multiply these all together, you see that you're below a 1% overall yield. That's tough. That means you have to start with at least 100 times of the amounts that you need in order to get what you need at the end, right? So you're going to lose over 99% of what you start with. The three-dimensional nature of it is also challenging. So these HPLC separations uh, work fine on the bench top, uh, doing anything that involves a column. And this is high-performance liquid chromatography, meaning things run through a column or a pipe. When you have to scale those up, the costs go up dramatically, and the challenges do too. Now, the current supply, according to Gilead, excuse me, <coughs> is that they have currently 
uh, they say enough for 140,000 courses. Now this information is a little bit data dated. They've probably doled that out already. That's not just 140,000 uh, injections. That's 140,000 courses, each which of which consists of a 10-day worth of injections. What will they need? Well, a lot. They've estimated several million, which is a round number, but I think you can imagine that if there's a worldwide need, and there is, it, the numbers of courses will certainly be in the millions, so they are ramping things up. Can they do it? Well, Gilead and the companies that they're collaborating with have extensive experience in this. For an example, this is Tamiflu, which is used for um, the flu, not for uh, the coronavirus, but for the flu. And I've taken this drug myself. I found it to be very effective. And uh, Gilead, in conjunction with other companies to help them out, made 200 million courses of this. So yeah, they've, they're experienced making uh, large-scale supplies. Uh, my major source for all of this information was uh, a presentation by Julia again. Jemmy, thank you for that, Julia. And I also took a good look at a chemical and engineering news article. If you want to take a look at it, there's the link there. This is a little bit about the challenges, challenges of synthesizing remdesivir on a large scale.